Good evening, everyone. How is everyone tonight? Good, good. Thank you so much for coming out tonight to our second of nine meet and greets with the acting police commissioner, Michael Harrison. My name's Shante Guy, and I will be your facilitator for the evening. So tonight's an opportunity for us all to get to know the new acting police commissioner better and for him to hear your hopes and concerns as it relates to policing our community. For those of you who have signed up to speak tonight, listen for your names. I will call five names at a time so that folks can come up to the microphone here and be ready to share your thoughts with us and the acting police commissioner. When you come up to the microphone, if you don't mind, please remind us of your name and tell us what neighborhood you live in. Whether it's Madison Park, Reservoir Hill, Sandtown, Bel Air Edison, we want to know where you come from. Each person will have two minutes to speak. When your two minutes are up, you'll hear a timer. I'm sure that everyone agrees that the PC should hear from as many voices as possible. As such, I'm going to be working to make sure that voices who haven't been heard in previous forums have the opportunity to share their hopes and concerns with the PC. It is, however, my intention that everyone who signed up to speak gets called to the microphone. If you have a question but would prefer not to ask it at the microphone, feel free to write your question down, raise your hand, and a City Hall staff member will bring the question to the front. In addition to the PC tonight, we're joined also by Major Gaines, Captain Featherstone, and Neighborhood Collaboration Officers Davis and Lee from the Central District. I'd like to acknowledge City Council President Jack Young. Is he still in the back with us? Oh. Yes, Public Safety Committee Chair, Councilman Brandon Scott. And Councilman of this district, the 7th District, Leon Pinkett. So before we get started, we're going to turn it over to Mayor Catherine Pugh for a few words. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see so many folks out here in this inclement weather, uh, but we, as you all feel, I think this is very important. So, you know, this is a really wonderful, diverse community and representing all parts of our city. But this community, as it relates to the Bolton Hills, the Reservoir Hill, uh, the Sandtown, and all of the other neighborhoods that are here, uh, are really great community folks. And so I'm excited to see all of you all here. And again, you know, we believe that we've made a great choice in our police commissioner who's joining us from New Orleans. I told him I know he's a little shocked by the weather, uh, but uh, I think they are welcoming them themselves to Baltimore. And as he said in one of our press events, he said, you know, he sees this as an opportunity, and not a challenge. And so, uh, police commissioner, again, thank you for accepting this opportunity to be a part of our community and more importantly, to engage with folks who really want to engage with the police department. And I also want to thank those who have participated in our consent decree, our oversight committee, our mediations. You know, we've done uh, over close to, what, 40 or 50 walks in neighborhoods and communities. We've done listening tours. We've knocked on doors. We've heard from folks, and many of you have joined us on our Violence Reduction Initiative Walk. I want to also acknowledge members of our Violence Reduction Initiative team for being here this evening. Thank you all as well. And uh, please, open yourselves up, share your concerns, because that's why he's here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We're going to ask Councilman Leon Pinkett to come up and say a few words, and then we will turn it over to the acting PC. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Mayor Pugh. Thank you for organizing this. Um, uh, community engagement is critical, and giving the, the community an opportunity to voice and um, have an opportunity to meet and greet with the acting commissioner is essential. And we've been joined by Senator Hayes. Thank you for joining us this, this evening. Uh, yeah. I also want to, um, if we would acknowledge, I don't know if she's in here, but Principal Hanson of the Dorothy, uh, Dorothy Height 
um, elementary school. What a beautiful school. Um, this is just an example of the investments that we're making across the city. Um, and um, I don't think, you know, if, if you would entertain me for just a moment, I want um, Acting Commissioner Harrison to know that we have good leadership in the Central District. So can we just give another round of applause to Major Gaines and his team? I, I know that um, Commissioner Harrison is, is trying to find out who his team is and, and the strengths in his team. And I just want to make it clear that we appreciate the leadership in Central District. Um, but once again, just welcome. Um, thank you all for coming out. I, I love the level of engagement. Um, this is really um, what will make our city safe, safer as, as we as residents come out and support um, public safety by being engaged. And I just want to say in closing that um, last night was an incredible night, the first night of the meet and greet, um, as there were um, a couple hundred people who came out, even in the weather as well. Um, but during the course of the night, um, uh, Acting Commissioner um, Harrison received a hug. Now, I don't see his wife tonight, so I, um, I'm just saying that um, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping an eye out for her, um, so there won't be no hugging going on tonight. <laughs> but thank you all for coming out and, and, and ask your questions and enjoy this evening. Thank you. I'll turn it over to the PC now. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. This is, this is so important. And I feel really blessed, honored, humbled, and, and privileged to be standing before you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for this, for this wonderful opportunity to lead at, at such a high level in the city of Baltimore. To my uh, council president, Senator, thank you so much. Our other council members, thank you all for your support, being out the second night in a row. Thank you to the team that put this together and organized this. Thank you so much to our commander and assistant commander and our community officers. Thank you all. We actually met earlier today to kind of share a little bit, went and chatted with a few officers at a shift change at roll call today just to kind of introduce myself, say hello to our team, to let them know that I fully support them uh, and will be advocating for them. But I'm also advocating for you too, the citizens and residents of Baltimore. And I just want to say how much of an honor and privilege it is to be here. For those who were with us last night, bear with me. Uh, I'll introduce myself to those who weren't with us last night but who are here tonight, and, and I'll be really brief. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm born and raised in New Orleans. Um, Raised my kids there. Met my wife when she was 13. I was 15. It wasn't a crime back then. We were just children. We lived next door to each other. We dated through high school and have been together ever since. Uh, 27 years married, two kids. My son's 25, my daughter's 21. Kind of grown on their own. So it made it really easy um, to assess where my life was and what would be the next chapter in my life. Um, and this is such a wonderful opportunity, as the mayor said. I've said over and over again. 28 years, 27 and a half years with the New Orleans Police Department, joined at the age of 22, worked in a number of tough assignments in the toughest parts of the city that I asked for because I felt that would groom and cultivate me and develop me um, because I've always been a high charger and overachiever and just trying to, to be that all that I can be. Not necessarily that I was going to take that slogan from the Army, but just, just to be the most that I could be. Raised by a single mother, my parents were divorced, my father passed away when I was 16, so I really was helping my mother raise my sister, my younger sister, and that was kind of the role I had after high school. Joined the Louisiana Air National Guard right before joining the police department. So I served eight years in Louisiana Air National Guard. But I joined the police department in 91, took those assignments. After about five years, found my way to um, the major case narcotic section. Keep in mind, this was the 90s now, in the height of the, the drug and crack epidemic and what we remember about those days. Um, did a lot of undercover work that, that helped me to find my way to work um, a year at the Drug Enforcement Administration working cases with them and then working with the FBI Drug Task Force. All that work led to me helping to take down a number of corrupt police officers. One of my best pieces of work was working undercover as a corrupt police officer to find the other corrupt police officers in our department and this was at as a young police officer. So even then I had no issues with figuring out who the bad cops were and helping remove them from our department. Um, and that got the attention of the chief who promoted me. And after a short while put me in internal affairs and asked me to take that skill set to continue that work, which I did for the next nine and a half years, working in administrative and criminal and specialized investigations within our internal affairs unit. So strong discipline is at my heart, is at my core what discipline is. 
and what integrity is and what morals are and how to incorporate that into our profession. What's ethical policing like? That's at my core. Later got promoted to com uh, assistant commander at a police district, later to commander where I was in charge of the biggest police district, the most populated district, the heaviest crime and most challenged district. Was there for three years, had crime reduction all of those years. Uh, and then the mayor at that time, Mayor Mitch Landrew, appointed me, by the way, over all of the assistant chiefs from the commander position to be the chief of the police department because my work apparently caught his attention and the citizens who lived in that district. Um, and for four years, I was with Mayor Landrew, and we experienced a number of uh, very positive, um, a number of very positive outcomes from crime reduction to increased citizen satisfaction. Four years, I came in year two of our consent decree um, and moved it forward to right when I left a couple of weeks ago, they were above 90% compliance in every single one of the paragraphs. So they're looking to exit now uh, sometime this year. That's another reason that made it easy for me to accept this opportunity. Um, figuring out that we had done such a good job there and now it was time to do something different. Taking the lessons learned from New Orleans and bringing them to, to Baltimore. Because the cities are so similar and the dynamics are so parallel and so similar um, that what is happening now we've been through. And I understand how that works, how to approach it. Um, and so yes, we will be building a dynamic team to make sure we can address all your issues. So that's just a little bit about me, but I'm really here to hear from you. And this week, next week, it is my intention by day and by night to hear from the members of the Baltimore Police Department, but to hear from the members of the community. Because while you call me commissioner and I'm your commissioner, the people who live in Baltimore will call me commissioner, which makes me your commissioner as well. And so I am always advocating for the residents of Baltimore to make sure I can deliver the type of police department you pay for, deserve, expect. And I can deliver the type of police department that you need your leader to be, the kind of leader you need me to be, and deliver the kind of police department that you can be proud of when you put that uniform on and go in public and say, I'm a member of the Baltimore Police Department. And so it is my goal to deliver all of that. But I can only do that by hearing what's important to you hearing what's important to our officers, and then taking that information, building a dynamic team, create a plan of action to take us to where we want to be. And so now it's time for us to hear from you. And so we're going to be taking notes, and I hope to have all of your names, addresses, the names of your neighborhoods, so that we can communicate back to you uh, and show you that what's important to you is also important to me. And if that's OK, we'll call our first person. Great. Thanks, BC. Everyone, please be sure. Uh, when I call you up to the microphone, uh, that you share with us your name, um, if you're comfortable doing that. I'll be calling your name, but we, we would ask that you remind us who you are and to let us know what your hopes, your concerns, your issues are, um, and tell us what neighborhood you live in. Bashante, yeah. for one second, please. Councilman, my wife gave me express permission <laughs> that if someone wants a hug, <laughs> as long as it's caught on camera, it's okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Understood. All right, so the first five names are Relique Hayes, Matt Hook, Justin Johnson, Fong Lee, and I am struggling with understanding this handwriting, so my apologies if I mess up your name. Um, is it uh, Tita? Tita? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hayes, when you're ready. Uh, so everybody, my name is Raleigh Hayes. I'm a community organizer with Black Leaders Organizing for Change, but that's not who I'm representing tonight. Um, I'm here uh, as a member of uh, a community organizer with the Legal Defense Fund, um, and we have a few questions. Uh, we work with the Campaign for Justice, Safety, and Jobs. We've been working on the implementation of the consent decree since day one. Um, and our first question is, and this leads back to what you were saying just recently about uh, discipline and integrity. Um, tomorrow, uh, Officer Gondo, I think, is sentenced in federal court for the Gun Trace Task Force. So what are, you, what are your plans to ensure that corruption like that doesn't happen again in the department? Or continue, just to be clear. First of all, good, good question. Just to check in for one second, because folks are allocated two minutes, would you mind listing all of your questions that you that, have for the that was That it. was it? That Great, was it. thank you. 
it, it's, it's going to be very important for us, and we will do this. It's about building measurements and systems of accountability. Those systems of accountability that, number one, lets us know who did what when, who knew about it what when, what did they do when they knew about it, and then what are we going to do to those who knew about it and didn't do anything. Does that make sense? Makes sense. That's, that's what's at the core of my heart, and it is as easy for me to implement as it was for me to tell you. Okay. And we are going to make sure that, first of all, we create systems of accountability that teach officers how to not make those mistakes and officers can step in and correct their colleagues. There's a program we created in New Orleans called EPIC. It's called Ethical Policing is Courageous. It's a peer intervention system by officers for officers that teaches officers how to step in and intervene on behalf of their colleagues when they see behaviors escalating. Just like we're taught to deal with citizens when we see their behavior escalating and then we respond accordingly. We're teaching ourselves, we taught them how to do that with their colleagues. So rather than having to have all the discipline on the back end, we're teaching officers, which we will teach in Baltimore, how to have officers save each other's careers by not allowing their colleagues to make those bad mistakes, thus hopefully reducing those levels of, of bad acts that cause what you just talked about, an officer getting in trouble, throwing his career away and, and going to prison. So that's one system of accountability that we, we will bring to New Orleans that's already been introduced to the Baltimore Police Department and it's, it's almost in its third or fourth year in New Orleans that's been proven effective. So you can look forward to something like that. But strong discipline will be a part of the Baltimore Police Department and it is imperative that we change the culture to f so that we know things are, when, when it's brought to our attention that bad acts are happening, that people are responding appropriately and taking the appropriate action so we can create the culture that there are consequences for those actions to try to deter people from doing that. And it, it will take time, but it's our goal to change the culture so people don't make the decisions to make those bad acts. Okay, thank Great you. Great question. So my first question, just, well, can y'all just hear me? Yeah. So, yeah. Sir, if I, if I could just check in. Sir, if I could just check in for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, the next person on the list is Matt Hook. Oh, this is just, oh my God. My bad. No worries. If you're interested in signing up to, to I think I'm on you the did. List, Justin. Great, great. Yes, you're the third person. Oh, Thank you okay. so much. We appreciate it. Um, hi, I'm Matt Hood. Um, I'm Good from uh, representing my work, dist uh, ho uh, work neighborhood of uh, Historic Jonestown. Uh, my question is about the squeegee kids. Um, I don't know if you've encountered them yet as your time as commissioner, but uh, like I work at some of the uh, historic sites and one of the things like your department has been doing in an effort to crack down on these kids is, um, you know, occupying corners. Um, some of these sites that I work at will have like a BPD unit there all day, lights running, sometimes sirens. Um, other times officers will drive by and basically yell at the kids, which um, doesn't seem effective. Um, ultimately, um, I don't think there's a policing solution, but what, does, what do you plan to do about this, um, the squeegee kids? First of all, thank you for that question. It was brought to my attention that that's a concern here in the city. And everything we want to do is about, number one, in, enforcing the law but making sure we're not infringing upon anybody's rights. And we have to do that at the same time all the time. But we want to make sure that the quality of life for the citizens is a good quality of life. So every enforceable action that we can take that we can do without some physical arrest or some legal action taken is what we want to do. And then we want to absolutely create an environment where they don't have to do that. We want to work with our mayor and our city services to find the resources to offer them opportunities so that they can make choices that are productive instead of having to do that. And I think it's a holistic, multi-dimensional approach to, to servicing them and giving them the resources they need so that they can make better decisions. That, that will be our approach. And when there are violations that require us to make some legal interventions, we'll do that when, it, when necessary. Sir, your okay. comment? Just making sure about my question. Um, so uh, my name's Justin, can everybody hear? Yes. Uh, my name's Justin. Uh, I'm a student from University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and I also do community organizing in Baltimore City with a group called Black Leaders Organizing for Change. Uh, just like a four question, have you read uh, or, you know, do you understand the consent decree? Like, are you familiar with it? 
I have read the consent decree. Mm -hmm. It's 510 paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And so I have read it. Uh, it's very similar to the New Orleans consent decree. I understand it in the sense that I understood the New Orleans consent decree and worked four and a half years as a chief and a year before the chief having to implement that. So, but it is imperative that my team and I go through the Baltimore mm -hmm. consent decree because it is, there are some differences and there mm -hmm. are some nuances and, that mm -hmm. are different. And so with that, what would you consider in the consent decree to be like your priority? Well, all of it is my priority because it is about constitutional policing and it is about mm -hmm. creating a culture in the department. And while there are 510 paragraphs, I would say some citizens would say all 510 are the highest priority. It is about changing a culture in an agency that makes the agency deliver police services that are both constitutional, fair, equitable, and just. And that the citizens, not only do the citizens perceive that, but the officers see themselves that way. When, when we are at a point when we see that they're fair, equitable, just, um, and the officers see that, and then your perceptions of us change, our perceptions of ourselves change, then we will say the consent decree okay. has, has run its course and was effective. And so one Mr. last Jones, question. Is it, this your last question? Th this Great, last thank one. you. And so specifically about, uh, oh. So specifically about the civilian uh, oversight program and like review, um, the current CRB only has the power to make recommendations. So like, what is your opinion on like that aspect of the you know, consent decree? So we welcome civilian oversight. I have no objection to civilian oversight. And when it comes to disciplinary actions taken, I am the, the CEO of the organization and will make the final decision on, on discipline. But I welcome recommendations because they help shape my opinion, but there is a disciplinary matrix that is created, uh, that is bound by laws, that is bound by policy. And certainly we want to make sure that we are not violating laws or violating policy, but the discipline ma matrix is strong, but fair and just. And so that there's citizen satisfaction and justice is actually served, and we accomplish what we intend to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Fong Lee. I'm, I live in Remington. I'm the president of the Greater Remington Improvement Association. Uh, first off, welcome to Thank you. Baltimore. Uh, I've asked all my friends in New Orleans, you know, I'm like, is this guy the real deal? And they say yes. Surprise, and they're like, yeah, he's the real deal. I'm very uh, hopeful. I, I'm very, very hopeful. Um, my question is this. Oh. Okay. So uh, my, my question is this. Um, Right now, uh, Johns Hopkins has proposed uh, legislation proposing a, a private police force, um, primarily within their Clary boundaries, some of which are in Remington. Um, we, I've spent months talking to my residents about this, um, and there's a lot of hesitation, there's a lot of anxiety, um, primarily around trust and accountability of, of this private institution um, controlling a police force. Um, part of, as I understand that legislation, is that uh, the BPD would help um, can create a memorandum of understanding, I mean, essentially help design this police force. And so my question is, how, how are you going to navigate that, um, helping to create an institution that uh, has, at least in my neighborhood, um, made a lot of residents nervous and fearful about who controls this institution, what are its priorities, and, um, and so how will you accomplish that and build trust not only with our larger institutions such as Hopkins and the residents in these areas? Very good question. I have been informed about that legislation, but not enough in detail to know the history of it and where it is right now. Um, only that there's an attempt to privatize and create a, uh, a sworn police department that's armed. What I can tell you is that um, I need to get more information, hear from the residents, hear from the, the leadership, perhaps at Johns Hopkins, hear from our legislators here within the city government to make sure that whatever is done is in the best interest of the city of Baltimore for the Baltimore Police Department. But keep in mind, also, the Baltimore Police Department is under federal consent decree. Johns Hopkins sits within that city, would have a police department with arrest powers that are not under a consent decree. And there, there are some different nuances there that we actually experience in New Orleans, because all the college campuses there are sworn armed police that sit within the jurisdiction, but not but not responsible for the terms of the consent decree. So there are a lot of issues there that require much more information, listening, and some very smart people coming together to figure out what's best for Baltimore, 
citizens and residents and John Hopkins at the same time. Thank you. Commissioner Harrison, uh, again, welcome. Thank you. And uh, my name is Atiba Nkrumah. I am the president of Upton's Marble Hill Community Association. Uh, I am also a board member of the Upton Planning Committee. Uh, and first of all, just kudos to our uh, command staff uh, who uh, works closely with us. And uh, we hope that uh, we can continue that work uh, because we know that we have a trust and that's important. And so my question gets to that uh, community policing strategy. Uh, how are we going to develop the kind of community policing strategy that is unique to each neighborhood? Uh, for example, in our neighborhood, uh, we see you know, an opportunity to grow our neighborhood, all right, but without the reduction of crime, violent crime in particular, all right, we're hamstrung. So we in our neighborhood actually want to work with the department to develop the kind of strategy that is unique to us. How do you see that? Very good question. So you talk about, you talk, for first of all, community policing by definition, and I said this last night, is not a program. It's a philosophy, it's a way of thinking, it's a paradigm shift. It's a way of thinking about how we deliver police services, how we engage with community members, and community members engage with police so that information flows to us and from us, to the citizens and from the citizens. So that we can create the kind of relationships that, number one, build trust, and two, solve problems. You're talking about two concepts, one called problem-solving policing and one called neighborhood-based policing. Because community policing in one community could look very differently than community policing in another part of the city. Although they both fall under the philosophy, and I think what you're talking about are community policing initiatives. Okay. Because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a way of thinking when you talk about community policing. But the answer to your question specifically is, there are, there, there are organizations that are already built within the city in the police department. The community, what's it called, commander? The, the CRV, CRC? CRC. The CRC, Community Relations, Relations Council. Mm -hmm. you, you actually now have the ability to work with your commander to devise what you, what you all agree works in that community. And I would, would open that up to everybody in the city to get involved and we did this in New Orleans. It was called Police Citizen Advisory Boards. Get involved and come up with plans that we think work and that we agree, you and the commanders, could work because it could be very different in other neighborhoods. And we welcome, we welcome that because it, it's about neighborhood-based policing and problem-solving policing. But it does require free time. Community policing is manpower intensive because it requires moving away from answering all of the calls we answer to kind of getting out walking, getting to know people, mm -hmm. which means I have to kind of stop doing something to do something else. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're, we're doing everything, and we're working to create smart, initi smart initiatives that free up that officer time so that we can build it back into those smart initiatives. So you will see that coming, but you and your commander right now can join forces to figure out what works and what you like to see and what other people like you that you bring to the commander that are engaged citizens like to see mm -hmm. and devise a plan that works and if it's within his purview and his authority and it doesn't hurt any other response times or any other policing functions, he's welcome to, he's welcome to adjust and has the authority to adjust his strategy to accommodate the citizens in his district. Okay, all right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Before we call the next five names, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Delegate Nick Mosby, who's joined us. Thank you, Nick. The next five names are Andre Robinson, Brown on Maiden, Karen Morell, Tracy Parker, Reverend Gray. Can I, uh, can I yield to the gentle lady from uh, to go before me? No, no. How are you? Great, sir. Good evening, Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. and again, welcome to Baltimore. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of the things that I find very similar between Baltimore and New Orleans is they're both deeply segregated cities. And that segregation still plays itself out in many corridors of the city. Uh, the executive leadership of a lot of organizations, when you go back to their offices, will be all white or all black. 
So what do you think your role might be as a member of the president's, of the mayor's council to help to integrate some of those departments that right now are still visited by the uh, results of this deeply entrenched segregation that's in the city? And so the policing becomes a part of an overall strategy and not just a one-off, you know, punishment-focused kind of uh, operation. Well, first of all, thank you. And, you know, being the commissioner here in the police department, we are hiring members to be members of the police department, both sworn members, both civilian members. And with, within our agency, at my hiring authority, we want to make sure that we have diversity, but we have talent. We have people who have both the will and capacity to serve as members of the Baltimore Police Department, preferably from the Baltimore area. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to being on the, on the mayor's cabinet, um, certainly we, we all welcome diversity and equity to make sure that hiring is equity, promotion has equity, selection has equity. And even when we deal with things like termination, there's equity in that as well. And so certainly you'll see that from me. I believe you see that from the entire mayor's cabinet. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening and welcome. My evening. name is Bronwyn Maiden. I'm with the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, and the reason I'm here tonight is that we have several grants that are working in Upton in West Baltimore, Upton and Druid Heights. We've worked quite well with the command staff as well as officers. I want to mention that first. Um, but I do want to mention that I think because the police department has so much going on that they have struggled with community engagement. And I know that that was an earlier question, but I'm just wondering, and I really have more of a statement, that I think that that has to become a real priority. Atiba already mentioned, we want the police in this neighborhood in terms of working with citizens. And I think we'd like to hear if you have any more suggestions. And then I want to just call out someone in particular that I want to make sure that you know. And that's Officer Charles Lee. That is our, what we consider our community <coughs> officer, even though he does not have <laughs> that title. Um, and I, I just want to say quickly that we just called him to the school on a suspected uh, child abuse case, and he just handles everything so well. He needs to have that title, but we need more Officer Lees. And I don't want to lose him, but maybe he needs to do some training and some other things. So I'm sorry. I mean, I had a lot of things there. Well, yeah, that was like 13 questions. But let, me, <laughs> no, 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 let, let, me, let me start at the end and work, see if okay. I can work backwards. Okay. First of all, great officer. Yes, he is. We, we just met. The, the goal is to, to create all of our officers because every member of the police department has to adopt a community policing mm -hmm. philosophy. It has to be our essence. It has to be our core. It has to be at the center of the, not just everything we do, but the way we think about community engagements. And you'll hear me say this at, at every new recruit class that starts and every recruit class that graduates that I'll charge the members of the department to do three things. Build relationships that were never built, improve on our good ones, and then repair our bad ones. If everything we do, every person we talk to, Every person we come in contact with, the way we handle their concerns, the way we listen to their concerns, the way we respond, the way we stand, our facial expressions, our body language suggests that we care. Obviously, he embodies that mm -hmm. because the, the response tells me that he's great. The goal now is to create 3,000 mm -hmm. of those and to make sure that all of us do that because it's at, the, it's at our core. And so it's our mission. It's also in the consent decree that we would make that our essence, our core. All training is surrounded around community engagement and community policing so that every piece of training touches on it so that now we're creating a culture that's community-based, community-oriented, community-sensitive. Mm -hmm. okay. And here, here's the thing I didn't mention in my opening. Though we're in a consent decree, I've charged the members of the executive team, the command staff, to do one thing for me, that we will do what's necessary to reform the police department because it needs reform, mm -hmm. because it's deserved, not because a consent decree is telling us to do it. Right. Right. And we're taking ownership of it. And when we fix it, we will take the credit for it, not the consent decree. But be, yes, we're made to do it. It's a federal mandate, and we're going to abide by it. But it's what the citizens pay for, expect, and deserve it's what we want to do, and we're going to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because we're being made to do the right thing. 
that's the message for the, for the Baltimore Police Department. And the one sentence I would say back is that I think you have to remember, obviously, the community being there with you. Absolutely. That's the struggle that we've been having with the Baltimore Police Department. And I, and I have to say, I believe it's because of all the things that are going on with them. They, they don't have time for everything. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. So to that point, I will say this. When it comes to time, yes, we've been asked to do, we're, we're asked to be all things to all people. And we're asked to go fast. But sometimes you have to slow down to go fast. Did you hear that? Sometimes you got to slow down to go fast. This is about slowing down right now. And when we slow down and get it right, we're going to start going fast. Yes, ma'am. Great. Good evening. Um, thank Maybe. you for being here this evening and for thank this you. opportunity. Uh, my name is Karin Morell. I live in Mount Vernon, um, and I've lived there for about three years, and I'm fortunate to work for the state of Maryland, and I can walk to work from where I live. Um, and last week, um, I was mugged on my way to work, and um, it was 8.30 in the morning, uh, a walk that I have walked thousands of times before. Um, and it's a relatively low crime neighborhood that I live in. I love living there. Um, and so I guess my question is, in a police force with limited resources, limited money, limited staffing, how do we um, devote those resources to the areas that most need them, that are the most high crime areas, but also to the maybe low, low crime areas? Like, how do we still pay attention to those areas? First of all, good question, and, and second of all, we, we, we're all sensitive to the fact that you've been traumatized. Thank you. And we're all, we're all sensitive to that. That's part of our culture change to make sure not just the commissioner, but all members of the department become sensitive and remain sensitive because people have needs, people are in trauma, and, and those things are important. But right now it's about listening and learning and developing information to create the smartest strategy possible to deal with deployment, both in areas that need them most and perhaps areas that don't need them. But we have to deliver police resources to the entire city because all of us deserve fair and equitable police services. And that's what we intend to do. But it, it will be done in a way that makes sure that we're tough on crime, not necessarily tough on people, and that we're creating smart deployment strategies that tell us when and where we need to be because crimes are committed. And that's, that's crime analytics and predictive analytics for policing that we will invest in and, and bring to the police department and enhance. It's already here, but we're going to enhance it to make sure we're using the best technology possible to understand who, what, where, when, and why crime is being committed, deployed to it to eradicate it, but deployed to it to prevent it, while doing the same thing in the areas because when you put police in one area, then we create displacement that really just pushes it somewhere else. And then you have victimization somewhere else, but we have to be there as well to make sure it's deterred, not displaced. And then it is imperative that all of us work together to create smart legislation and smart consequences that make people choose better on the front end. And so it's not just about the response from the police, but it is about changing the minds of the people who want to commit a crime. Why do people commit crime? And so it's always seemed to be the focus on what are we doing about it, but actually, why do they commit the crime? And we're, we're working on both of those together. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And I do want to say the officer that I worked with was, was very empathetic, and he was really great. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Um, before I begin, thank you to all of the great police officers of Baltimore City whose great acts get overlooked by the bad deeds of a very, very few here in Baltimore City. So thank, thank you, you very that. much. Thank you for that. I had to write it down so I don't forget. Um, and I respect the roots that you have with your hometown of New Orleans. I've been there, uh, Essence. Um, however, <laughs> the relationships that you have established there don't exist for you right here, right now. What is your plan to deal with a city that has lost trust in its ability to secure its own neighborhoods as well its ability to trust its elected and selected officials? Well, that, that plan, you're part of that plan. Yeah, you can clap for that. The plan is to be here tonight to talk to you. Oh, I'm coming back. I'm from Zone 15. Everybody here knows Park that's, Heights. That's, that's, the first, know that's, Park the first, Heights. that's the first part of the plan. Okay. For us to get to know and for me to get to know not only the people of Baltimore, but the nuances of the communities. So I can get an a, a understanding of the history, 
the, the nuances that are different from community to community, the things that trouble you and your community, but trouble those over here in their community. And so I can get an understanding for myself rather than getting just briefings from the members of the police department and our electors about what is happening, which I'm getting that, but I wanted to hear from you. And so that's the first part of the plan. And now, as we move through this week and next week, hearing from all the citizens and residents and what, what's important to all of you and what you see on a daily basis, how you feel about what you see, helps us devise deployment strategies that address that. And so that's what, that's what this is all about. And then, of course, again, it's about the crime fight, it's about your quality of life, but it's also about police reform, which is in, in culture change, which is all done at the same time. Is Reverend Gray in the room? And is he still interested, he or she still interested in speaking? All right, we'll move on to the next five names. Thank you guys for being so attentive. Ann Winder, Rabbi Daniel Berg, Adrian Harpole, Ms. Winder, we'll start with you. Sure. Good evening. Welcome Good evening. to Baltimore. Thank you so much. Um, I am a lifelong resident. I am a taxpayer. I'm below oh, I am a property owner, a business owner, and I am part of the board. I'm a board member of Markets and Emergents Association, which has uh, Lexington Market as its stakeholder. Um, on a daily basis, there are the illegal pharmaceuticals, as I call them, illegal pharmacies, as I call them, that set up shop 6 a.m. and are there till 6 p.m. And you can see them standing in front of the same businesses every day, day in and day out. That is an issue that needs to be addressed because until we address that, our effort to solicit new businesses in the area is certainly hindered by that. So I would like to know if there, if you could put that on your to-do list or something that you can address with regards to that matter. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, that actually came up last night as well. Great. And even before last night, okay. I've been briefed. And it is already on our to-do list. Okay. And when it comes to, when it comes to drug selling, mm -hmm. when it comes to illegal guns, when it mm -hmm. comes to violent crime, we, we, it, is, it is always on my to-do list. It is always something that we're concerned about. And, and yes, we, we're working on that. And I will just tell you, stay tuned. Okay. You, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you something that I'm not telling you. Okay, 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 very good. You have to feel me rather than hear me on this. I got you, I got you. Okay, very good. So, so but that and other places are, 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 are being addressed. And so uh, my team and I have been talking about the, the challenged places in Baltimore that need immediate attention, um, and it's, it is being addressed. I'll give you my word on it. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Great to see you. Good to see you. Uh, so I've been trying to collect some questions from congregants and those I uh, run with in different circles. And uh, so some of the things that I were on my mind have been addressed already. So I'm going to ask this uh, question that comes from a congregant. Uh, I'm the Rabbi Beth Am Synagogue uh, here in Reservoir Hill on, on Utah Place that we're currently worshiping at Mount Lebanon Baptist Church um, until we come back from our renovations. Uh, so this is from a congregant who has spent uh, significant time in both Baltimore and New Orleans, um, and so I'll just I'll just uh, read the question: um, uh, How and to what extent they were able to restore the retroactive investigative function in the New Orleans Police Department in the aftermath of Katrina flooding, when violent crime was overwhelming in the city? 
There was a point at which 140 murders or so had only been met with a handful of arrests and no successful prosecutions. Those kids charged with murders called it doing your 60, because after 60 days, a Hicks-type rule arrangement would uh, inevitably lead to the state dropping the charges and release. It was that bad. Given that Baltimore's clearance rate and conviction rate for violent crime is now collapsed, is there a remedy that NOPD brass employed to restore retroactive investigative deterrent to repeat violent offenders? Good question. <laughs> Very long, good question. Um, during, I, I wasn't the chief during Katrina. Right. Yeah, I'm aware of that. I, I, was, I was at the rank of a sergeant, and it, it was horrible. I mean, horrible. And there were, you know, there were a number of challenges, all types of leadership challenges. I can say that it took years to restore the NOPD. Um, but it was all of that that led us to a consent decree. And the consent decree with the reform mandate to fix all of the issues that led to the collapse of a number of things, leadership and performance and all and accountability, all of those, the collapse of all of that led to a consent decree. The consent decree was about 100% makeover of the police department. And so that came in 2011 and then, you know, 2012, and then so in 2014, I become the chief in the second year. And then it became doing assessments of our performance capacity and ability, individual leadership and performance assessments of the individuals in the department to figure out who were the best people to be in position, for example, to be homicide detectives, to be sex crimes investigators, or robbery, or shooting detectives. And so, but all of, all of that came out of a federal mandate to reform with oversight, with, with really bright people helping us to identify our strengths and weaknesses, mm -hmm. and to figure out a pathway to reform the police department. And I think that's what we have here. And so it is not about me just fixing it all. There's actually a blueprint on how to reform the, the, the police department, and we're following that blueprint. But now I'm in the process of assessing the department's capacity mm -hmm. and individual units' capacity, for example, like the homicide unit, like the SWAT unit, like the narcotics and sex crimes investigation, to make sure we have the capacity to fairly and justly and competently conduct those investigations, and that the people there have the will and capacity <coughs> to be there to conduct those investigations. And then the oversight that we have is holding not just the department accountable, but me accountable to that. I believe coming into this consent decree over time, you're going to see uh, more competence, um, more character, more competence, more compassion, mm -hmm. and more empathy from the police department. But all of that's coming with this makeover that we have called this consent decree. Okay, and then could you say is any, uh, you know, specifically about best practice in terms of re uh, repeat violent offenders, what you've learned, uh, given that you understand you weren't the chief during Katrina, well, but just sort of, what have you learned from so, so that, what's that, changed there that you could good implement question. here? That, that competency yeah. issue was what came out of assessments. For example, I invited the uh, National Institute of Justice, NIJ, and the Bureau of Justice Assistance from the Department of Justice to come in and conduct an audit assessment mm -hmm. of my homicide unit that gave me recommendations that we follow. And I believe some of those audits have already happened within specific units of the Baltimore Police Department, specifically the homicide unit, but other audits could be forthcoming to tell us about what those best practices are, and then we can follow the recommendations of the experts that come in to tell us what are our weaknesses and how do we improve on it. Um, all of that's happening right now, and any, any help that we can get to tell us how we can improve, we're looking and willing to accept that. And it is about the cultivation, grooming, and development of our leaders to make sure he and others can lead at a high capacity. So he understands, and they and my female commanders understand leadership at its highest level and can identify weaknesses and then create pathways to strengthen those weaknesses. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sir, before you answer your question, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Councilman uh, Eric Castello from the 11th District. Thank you for joining us. And if you wouldn't mind sharing your name with us in the neighborhood that you live in. Sure. Thank you. My name is Adrian Harpool. I live in Madison Park. <clears throat> I serve as the president of the Madison Park Improvement Association. Yes, sir. Good to see you. And I'm currently serving as chair of the Midtown Benefits District. Yes, sir. Which is Madison Park, Bolton Hill, Charles North, and Mount Vernon. 
we are one of the most diverse, both economically, um, educationally, ethnically diverse neighborhoods in the city. We're in the heart of the city, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get from one side of the city or the other without going through Midtown. Like some of the others who uh, talked before me, there are some definite nuances, and I'm glad that you mentioned nuance because you can't do this with a broad brush. We welcome you to come into our community and as work with the officers that we've worked with to understand the particular challenges that we have. Uh, one size doesn't fit all. We have a lot of different issues. There's a, there's a commercial district. There are a lot of residential districts. We have churches. We have major thoroughfares like North Avenue and other places, Mount Vernon and other places where you know, currently some other challenges that, that with traffic and the like. So we're here, we want to see you succeed and Thank we're you. opening the door, opening our, our hands and our, our arms uh, to work with you. We have a, a benefits district that has a special assessment. So our taxpayers pay an additional fee to augment the city services, both for cleaning, greening, and also with police. So we have a private, uh, we have not a private firm, but we have a, our own unit in which we employ off-duty police officers to patrol some parts of our mm -hmm. neighborhood. And they work, can, they work again in concert with those on-duty police. So it's an interesting community. Uh, it's one that can be a model for the rest of the city. But we really encourage what you're doing. I'm, I'm really pleased at what I've heard, but obviously the proof is in the pudding, so we're going to let you get to work, and we'll see. As you say, uh, stay tuned, right? Yes, sir. All right, but thank you and welcome. Thank you so much. Hello, how you doing, sir? Great. How are you, sir? Uh, good, good to see you. This is the community that I come from, the Reservoir Hill community. I've been in this community for 60 years, and um, I just wanted to know, is there any type of program or project that you have coming up for the for the the squeegee guys and the homeless guys is making it like like really harassing for the motorist that has to stop down here at 83 and on Franklin and all you know just coming up and all I mean me and my partner Stokey we we do a lot for this city man I mean we love our city this is where we come from yeah and we just hate to see it get tore apart like it is like it's being doing. Thank you for, for your concern. There, there's a holistic approach to both. What I've been briefed on is the squeegee kids issue and certainly the homeless issue in, in the city. And so the mayor's office has an entire team working on a whole approach to providing resources to make sure that those young people have opportunities so that they can choose better and that we can approach them in a, in a way that's not an enforcement way. And when we need to approach them in an enforcement way, we're certainly going to do that right. when they commit violations. We're certainly going to do that. Yes. When it comes to the homeless population, there's an entire team within city government working to eradicate homelessness yes, sir. so that we don't criminalize it, but we treat it for what it is as people who are in need of help and who are, who are between blessings and who need our help yes, and not to be prosecuted because they're not breaking the law. Yes. They just need a place right. and they need some help. So yes, there are plans. It's not a plan exclusively in the police department, but the police department's part of the holistic mayor's plan to address the homeless issue and the squeezy kids issue. Well, I'd just like to say that I trust and believe in you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank sir, you. would Appreciate you mind sharing your name with us, please? My name is Felman Miller. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wanda Best and Larry Wallace. Ma'am, what's your name? Feel free to, to join them in line. I'm going to ask you all just to remind the PC of your name and your neighborhood, please. Hi, Commissioner. Good evening. Wanda Best from the Upton Planning Committee. I'm the Executive Director, and we're responsible for managing the Main Street program, and that exists on historic Pennsylvania Avenue. We go from Fulton to Martin Luther King. Um, our challenge on Pennsylvania Avenue is illegal activity around businesses, laudering around the methadone clinic, and corner stores not being able to control their fronts. How do you plan to address these challenges? Thank you. That was brought to our attention last night as well. So hearing all of these concerns, we're working with our team to make sure that we can 
that we can find ways to deal with both violations that are happening on public property and on private property. And that we're working with the stores, the owners, the land owners, the store owners, to make sure that, number one, they're doing what they can do to mm -hmm. give information to us and that we can receive the accurate information so we can respond accordingly. And that the officers are equipped and trained to know what to do and how to handle those incidents on both public and private property. Mm -hmm. And then how to best proceed to enforce that, in a, whether it's local ordinances or whether it's violations of state law. And so right now, I'm doing assessments within the police department to figure out what we have and what we know and what our officers know and what they think they can and can't do. Mm -hmm. um, and so right now, it's about me learning about all that so I can devise a plan to go and address issues like that. I don't really know right now what the officers know they can do or can't do. Okay. And so, but that's a good question that, that you have to bring to my attention okay. uh, because that's not anything different than we experienced in New Orleans and what we found was that the officers just did not know how to do things and enforce laws that had violations on private property okay. versus in a public right of way or public spaces. And what kind of timeline are you looking at? Well, we, we are looking at every part of the department right now. With over 2,500 officers, we're trying to figure out leadership capacity at every level, supervisory capacity, who needs to be where, what the skill sets are. What are our weaknesses and gaps? How do we strengthen those weaknesses and fill those gaps? And so I really can't give you a timeline, but every day, every part of the city and every problem is being addressed every day, all the time, at the same time. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Best. One, one more question. Does Pennsylvania Avenue come to the top of the list as far as priority? Every street that... <laughs> Every street that has a crime being committed on it is at the top of the list. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Good sir. How you doing? Um, my name is Larry Wallace, and I am um, under the leadership of, of Dr. Andre Humphrey for the trauma response team, and I'm also under the leadership of uh, Christine Flowers, the director of the homeless trauma. I wear many hats. I'm the spokesperson for all the care drivers in the state of Maryland also talk on the radio. I've been driving around the Baltimore City. What what were you going to do with the the motorcycle, the bikers? Because uh, if they, I, I didn't see them hit people. I didn't see cars hit them. What, I know you can't chase them, but what is the protocol with the bikers? I mean, if we have accident with them, do we have to stay there, call the police? What, what the protocol? That, thank you for that. First time I'm hearing about an issue with motorcycles. I've, I've heard about a number of things in my, in my first day and second day. Mm -hmm. um, first time I'm hearing about that, it's, it's not any different than anywhere else in the country. You know, we will get back to you on the answer on what the protocol is for, for chasing motorcycles or what the response is for dealing with motorcycles. Um, generally what is being seen around the country, police departments are having issues chasing motorcycles that are just driving erratically and committing crimes because sometimes we want to make sure that our policy doesn't create more harm than good. And so while they're driving recklessly, sometimes chasing them can make it worse mm -hmm. because they kill themselves or kill somebody else or will hit somebody and kill somebody else. And so we can't do something that actually puts more people in danger than the first thing that actually happened. So that's kind of the general sense in policing everywhere. But I'll get back to you specifically about what the BPD protocol is with dealing with motorcycles. And I'm assuming you're talking about the, the, the dirt, dirt bikers. bikers. The dirt, dirt bikers. bikers, yeah. So, okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Good evening, my name is Octavia Anderson Williams. Good evening. I live in the Ashburg, New Salvatore community. Very familiar with the Big Easy. I love it, it's my second place next to Baltimore. Yes, ma'am. Baltimore's a city that I love, but I've seen a lot of changes happen in Baltimore City. From the, from the, I know you have anything to do with the trash. I've already spoke to my man, the trash is still sitting there. But I'm talking about when the guys can just sit up, open up a drug shop, and people, people pay taxes. They don't pay any taxes. Put their chairs on the side. I've told everybody from who's in their community, hey, that's not my community, but I drive through there because I'll forget. I'm afraid that I'll forget that I'll be the one in a gunfire and get shot. They said to place the chairs down, and the 3300 block of Edgewood Road, 21216. 
I live across from the other way. I've been traveling that way since a child, walking from one side of the community to the other side of the community to see my friends. It's just a different thing in Baltimore. The cops walk around and act like they don't see anything. Or my biggest concern, you got this big salary. And then we still gonna pay you anyway. If we don't select you, you still gonna get paid. I like to get a job offer like that. I like to get my, my somebody to pay my allowance, $3,000 allowance for my home until I can find somewhere else to live. I just think you're getting a whole lot and not really proving yourself to the citizens of Baltimore yet. I think you should prove yourself first. You got a murder rate of 300. I sat in my house while my friend was being murdered in a car and he was a CPA. It wasn't like he was saying drugs, he was killed. That crime was never solved. Put in a back burner and what they say is that the community don't help them. But what, what is the process of solving the crime? Are you gonna go back and say we need to get these cold cases and find out who killed who? So do you have a process for that? We have a process to fix it all, and the answer is now, yes. You said you got a process to fix it all, but how are you going to fix it? Because every we've had a lot of police commissioners, and I don't think we have one that lasts a year yet in Baltimore City. Not one year, because you come from New Orleans, and I've been there. It's not like the crime in, in Baltimore. We're out, I can't say every police, because my, some of my family members are police officers, mm -hmm. that we allow this crime to happen. We let them set up shop with cheese. And I got a picture of my phone, I took a picture of my house. I can't believe this. They're sitting down. So how can that business that's in that area mm -hmm. be not a part of what's the problem is in the community? Because I wouldn't go there to buy anything if all the drug dealers are sitting there. The church left. They ain't not a praying mother there, but the church left. Mm -hmm. so, so, what it's, so what should we look for you to expect from you? Because you only got to get 300 murders. That's to me, once you get 300, we're going to give you 3%. To me, that just doesn't make any sense when there's so many murders. I don't even watch the news anymore for murders. I don't even know how many Baltimore City have now because my friend one year was number one in Baltimore City. So how many murders do we have here now? I think there are 30. How many? It was yesterday, I think there were 30. 30, but how many did we solve last year? I'm, this is my second day. It's your second day? This is my second day. That should have been the first thing you should have asked for because you, your, your goal is 300, only 300. I, and I think, it should, I think it should be lower than that. My, my goal is to not have any. So if I, I get one, one murder is too many. I think one is too many, but I think your goal for 300 is too, is too short. Well, we have a process that you're going to break it mm -hmm. down the next year, you'll say you'll get 200. The next year, you'll get 100. Because I don't expect you to come here and just clear the murder rate out and just one year and be wiped out. But do we say is it 300 you get, 200, 100? Because I've seen the change in Baltimore City that people don't pay no taxes, got more rights than me, to sit in the corner and sell drugs all day long. And they're in mm -hmm. neighborhoods that are senior citizens that are 80, 90 years old. And that, and that neighborhood just be a great neighborhood. Yep. So what, what do we do for that? Or, or, so you think it's fair that we go for 300 for you, 200 for you? Could I check in here for a second? I just want to make sure that we captured everything. I'm taking notes over here okay. to make sure the PC can address your, your question directly. So it sounds like um, feeling proud of the time that you lived in Baltimore and been here for a really long time, seeing things change um, as you've lived in the community, um, concerns about illegal activity and safety associated with not only your commute, but also people that live in the neighborhood that you're driving through, wanting to understand the, the PC's perspective on that. Um, also, um, concerns about um, um, wanting to see evidence and proof of um, the PC's worth around getting the job done and really wanting to hear what his plan of action is. Did I kind of sum that all up? You kind of summed it up. Great. Good. PC? All great points, and thank you for all of them. Thank you for all of them. And I, I appreciate your, your pride in the city you live in. Um, and I want to address all of it. And it, it may take a second, but I want to address all of it. I'm, I'm here to help change the culture of the Baltimore Police Department so this department can perform at a high level. So the officers, when you see them, are doing the things that you expect them to do, like taking the appropriate action when we see things that are wrong and people are committing crimes, which I think you address. And when they see that, we take the appropriate action and that we're not afraid of it, but we know how to do it, but we do it fairly and justly and that we send a message to the criminals that we're not going to allow you to just set up shop, whether it's on private property or public property, in front of a store or anywhere else, that we're taking the appropriate action. And if 
we're doing what we can to eradicate that and cut that kind of stuff out because it's really tearing away at the fabric of our society and ruining your quality of life, making you not even like the neighborhood you grew up in and love so much. So changing that culture and making us perform at a high level is certainly one of the things. Having the department and creating the type of consequences for bad actors like drug dealers to make sure that when we do that, that there are consequences for them and they don't come back to do it all over again and that everybody in the department is working on that. I want to make sure that you understand I'm not expecting to get anything from anybody. I left a career of 28 years and retired, packed up my home, kicked my kids out. <laughs> my son got married last week. Congratulations. And, and I'm here living in Baltimore now. Not yet received my last check, but haven't yet received my first check. But you know you're going to get a big one. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a process between the time I left a career and the time I'm actually, actually a member of the Baltimore, which is a level of uncertainty. And so I'm here 1,500 miles away from a job I left, a home I left, a family I left, familiarity that I left, and people that loved me to come to a level of uncertainty where I don't even know. And so I'm here now, not trying to convince you, but to at least show that I'm concerned enough to hear from you. And so I'm not asking for anything, but I'm, I'm looking out for my wife who came with me, who gave up her career to join me. And we're serious here about being part of this Baltimore <coughs> family and residents. And whatever you're experiencing, I'm going to experience too because I'm living here now. Depends where you live. No, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm in Baltimore. And, you know, we're, we're connected. We want to make sure that we build the kind of police department you pay for, you expect, and you deserve. And we want to give that to you. And that's going to take time. When it comes to the homicide rate and shooting rate, we want to make sure that we can address all of that. When I say all of that, because the, 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 the culture of why people commit crimes and pull the trigger to shoot other people is what we have to change. Yeah. And so I need help from everybody to change the reason why people pull the trigger. Because the decision to pull the trigger is not made when you pull the trigger. The decision to pull the trigger is made when you stick the gun in your pocket and walk out of the door at home. That's conflict resolution skills, that's parenting skills, that's consequences on the back end that are not there. And we're dealing with all of that. And so we want to develop a department that's accountable to its leadership but accountable to the citizens so that you can have pride in the department. And at least you know that when you call us, we come, and what's expected of us, we'll do. That's what I'm here to try to help change and develop and give to the citizens. Thank you so much for your question, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> Sir, if you don't mind, just before you start, sure. I want to call um, a next couple of names here. Uh, Archie Williams, and I think this is Greg Maynard. Greg, Gray, maybe? Gray, Magiana. Thank you. What Ali said. Thank you. Oh, yep, thank you. Go ahead. Armand, Archie. Good to meet you. Good sir. evening, sir. So I have two questions. Yes, sir. One question is Would you be open for um, 20th century technology to help to put a, 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 a restricted uh, uh, connection to help you close the case closure rate? Oh, absolutely. I'm open to the, the absolute best technology in the world to help the Baltimore Police Department be the 21st century world-class police department we want it to be. Wonderful. My second question to you is, what system would you put into play to wean out all of the bad apples into your department? That's a great question. And like, and like I told you earlier, that if you were here earlier, that's at the... That's, I'm so sorry I'm late. That, that's, at my, that's at the core of my fiber and my being. I would love to hear it. And it's about building systems of accountability and a disciplinary system and a performance metric system that makes people perform at a high level but tells us when people don't so that we know it. Technology is probably something we need to help us know what we don't know and to teach us what we don't know so that we can take the appropriate action when it's brought to our attention, but we can learn about it when it's not brought to our attention. And then take the corrective action against people who knew about it but didn't do anything about it. And then sometimes, and here's what had to happen to me in New Orleans, 
I had people who did something and people who knew about it. As it turns out, the people who knew about it are fired because what the people, what they actually did wasn't really that bad. And sometimes, sometimes we have to send a strong message. I'm not saying what I'm going to do or when I'm going to do it. What I'm saying is we're going to build the best, robust, most robust systems of accountability to address and change the culture of a department um, so that it has strong discipline, it has flexible but strong policies. And we have systems that teach us what we don't know, and we have leaders that hold themselves accountable, that we can hold accountable, and that you can hold accountable. Wonderful. Good answer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think the next person is Gray, and then we'll take these two gentlemen. Yep. Gray is asking you guys to set, step up to the mic. Thank you. All right. Uh, my name is Derek Jones. I'm a resident of Reservoir Please. Hill. And uh, first of all, I read a little bit about you. I like your attitude. Um, <laughs> We all know a bad attitude is like a flat tire. You ain't going nowhere till you change it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yes. So with that said, uh, I'm very receptive to you and looking forward to uh, talking to you on more occasions just, Absolutely. than just this. One question or either one suggestion I have is I want everyone to just think about when you're driving here in the city and you pull up alongside of someone with limo tenant windows. It's not transparent, you feel a little intimidated, and you're wondering, is this a jack or what? And I'm looking for some transparency, trans, you know, transparency in terms of, I want to be comfortable when I'm driving in the city. And I can't envision, I, I just can't fathom the thought how state police, sheriffs, city police don't see these cars. And they haven't been ticketed. And also, now they're starting to use the front window. They're starting to tint the front window. I mean, even at night, it becomes a concern as to safety. So I'm suggesting that if we do the simple things first, that maybe don't cost nothing. All it costs is just an effort. I don't know if they're using the excuse that they need some kind of gauge or some device to determine the level of tint it is. But anybody can tell limo. Yeah. And these cars should be ticketed even as they are parked. I don't, if I was a, a cop, I sure wouldn't walk by, by a car that had limo tent with a regular license plate and not limo and not issue them a ticket. So if we focus on the simple things, I think we can find, our, find our other crimes being suppressed or either not even considered because they are too obvious to us now. Okay, they're not hiding behind that windshield. Uh, number two is I understand that there's a recruitment deficiency and thinking of what you've just mentioned this evening about the uh, cooperation as far as responsibility, accountability, integrity, what are you doing in terms of uh, implementing a recruitment process that would bring these type of individuals that have these type of morals and characteristics, even though you emphasize it and train them in it? that really understand what you're looking to train them in and, uh, and receptive of it so that we have a good police force. Yeah, thank you, all great points. The, the, the limousine tent is, is an issue in this city, it's an issue in every city. Um, and, but I think the issue of enforcement is, is twofold. Yes, legitimately, you, you, the, the, the legal legitimacy is to have the window tent meter to tell you the, the density and darkness of the tent. That's one aspect. But I think the other aspect is more likely a resource allocation because it does take time to stop and pull over and do the things that require issuing a, a ticket. But for every action here, there's not an action being taken somewhere else. And I think it's resource allocation and time allocation, wherein sometimes in prioritization, where if we're pulling over cars or stopping cars and writing tickets, then perhaps the manpower shortage is causing us to not be doing something else. And so I believe it's a delicate balance in making sure we address the quality of life issues, we address traffic enforcement issues, we address violent crime issues, property crime issues, and all the other nuances in between. And it's a delicate balance. That's what earlier in the meeting you heard me talk about smart initiatives. Smart initiatives that are forthcoming are, are going to help us reduce officer burdens that free up time. And every opportunity we have to free up officer time, we can build it back into something else, like an enhanced traffic enforcement initiative, whether it's tent or whether it's speeding or, or something else, or community policing or other initiatives. 
that don't take officers away from answering your important calls when you call them, but give them the free time to do some of the smaller things that I think you're talking about. And when it comes to recruitment, we, we're bringing something that's going to start Friday. It's called Recruit Stat. And it's a, it's a comp stat process that brings the leadership of the city and the police department together to look at every aspect of recruitment from the time a person clicks on a mouse to apply online for an application, to look at every action item all the way to the point that they're hired, who's responsible for that action item, what are they doing about it, and what we're going to do to them if they don't do what they're supposed to do. And so that's what this recruits that process that starts this Friday, because we realize there is a, re a recruiting issue that we have that needs to be far more robust than it is so that we can attract the best and brightest from Baltimore, but from anywhere. But we want to make sure that we are filling the ranks of the police department and giving our local people an opportunity to come be part of a solution. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. My name is Brandon Smallwood. Good evening. From Southwest Baltimore. I have two questions. My first question, and I know you said you've only been here two days, is uh, do you plan on living in the city of Baltimore? I already do. Okay. All right. Now, the reason I asked that was. And my wife is spending a whole lot of money in this city right now, too. <laughs> right. And I, I, I commend you on that. And the reason because I asked you that, because if you're not really in the city of Baltimore, you living around the surrounding counties or whatever, you can come in here, you can do your job, get your hours in, and then you're not really in the fire. I'm here. I get it. Okay. <laughs> That's great. I drove up All right. Wednesday, but got here late Thursday. Okay. And I'm here. All right. I hope you do a and, good and, job. And moved in. Thank I you. I hope you do a good job. Thank you. We're going to hold you accountable to that. Secondly, I heard you speaking on the uh, crime rate, and everybody knows we mm -hmm. off the chain up here, and I get it. But this is the thing I want to say. Everybody that, let me rephrase this, and forgive me because I'm quite passionate. But this is what I want to say. Are you speaking with the mayors, the mayor, I'm sorry, Ms. Peter the mayor about creating jobs. The youth, not only the youth, but the people in the city of Baltimore, we need jobs, man. Everybody knows that if you are making a livable income, your community goes up, crime goes down, we ain't worried about nobody running around the corner trying to bust your head open because you got a couple dollars in your pocket. You know, so, are y'all talking about that issue? Because I believe, and it's proven, if the economy is booming wherever you live, crime is down. If it's not, crime is up. So how are you going to speak with your superiors and get information and bring about a resolution for people to get these jobs in here, man. Because everybody don't want to be running around with guns. Everybody don't want to be selling no drugs. You know, people got families. People risking their lives, knowing any day they can come outside, a pack on them or whatever. Man, I ain't never got to worry about the police. I got to worry about the corporate police. I got to worry about these stick-up boys coming behind me. I got to worry about this, that, and the third. Everybody just not running out here mad like everybody think or want to portray that they are. Mm -hmm. People are doing this because it's desperate times. And in desperate times, it's desperate measures. And everybody knows that self-preservation is the first preservation. So how can you speak to your superiors and y'all get some things going on where well, we can help out these people? I mean, not these people, because I'm people. I mean, everybody, where we can get this thing on the ball and Cut this crime down. Everybody talking about crime, this crime that, oh, they just running out here doing this, that, and the third. No, everybody know it ain't that cut and dry. Right. Thank you, Mr. Smallwood. PC? Very good question. The answer to it is yes. Yes, we are talking about jobs. As a matter of fact, I did my homework, and it's called the multidisciplinary approach. This whole violence reduction initiative is all about all the resources given 
input on the front end that address all the issues, homelessness, jobs, poverty, education, conflict resolution, skills, the skills to get jobs, living wages, mental health, drug abuse, all of those issues are being addressed. Had they not been something that was being addressed, I would not have accepted this position because all of, the, all of it would have just been on the police. But because I was impressed with the fact that there is a multidisciplinary approach to dealing with the social, the social ills of society that cause people to make bad decisions to commit crime. And that's what you're talking about. You're talking about one of the issues, which is jobs, but there are many issues, but specifically jobs. Yes, we are talking about that, and that's part of the reason that helped me make this decision to transfer out of New Orleans to Baltimore so that I knew that there was a support system and that there was a structure and that there were smart people putting their minds together to figure out how to stop people from making those bad decisions and giving people the jobs and the skills necessary to get those jobs and moving the barriers out of, way, out of the way that helped them get the jobs that otherwise they'd be disqualified for. Because all of that is in place and I believe will be more robust over time, it, helped, it was easier for me to make that decision. And so the answer to your question is yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, my name is Gray Maggiano. I'm Good a evening. pastor here in Bolton Hill, just down the street, and I live there as well. I apologize for being late. We have no a slight apologies. leak in the church roof, so if you know a roofer, if you've met a roofer at your <laughs> roofing, uh, let me know. Uh, I have two real basic questions. Uh, the first is uh, one of the, the secrets that I keep from my parishioners is that before I went into ministry, I had a career in criminal justice reform. Yeah. So you're saying all the right things. Um, you have all the language down. You, you've done your homework. You know this stuff. You're new to Baltimore, so you don't know our problems yet. Um, I want to ask if you will commit to coming back in a year and doing this whole thing again when you can answer these questions in Baltimore language and not in generic criminal justice academic language? I'm, I'm happy to come back in a year, but I'm happy to have, have you meet with me as often as, as we can physically do it. What's, I mean, but but it's, the, it's answer, the answer is yes. All the, you have all these people who are coming all across the city who, who mm -hmm. care about this city. Uh, they're invested. They want the city to be better, and they feel a real disconnect between themselves and the department. And I think you have the ability to make that connection again and build that trust again. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to happen with just the generic buzzword language, and it's no offense to you, it's, you, this is your second day, so you're not expected to have all the answers for us today. But, you know, in a year, I think you will. I, I welcome and you, that. You'll be able to have, build that trust with the city. I, I welcome that, be Thank happy you. to do it. Thank you. Uh, the second question, and this is something that, uh, you know, as, as someone with a kid in the school system here in Baltimore City, we have, you know, a tremendous problem with, with juveniles who they make one mistake and they're in the system and they can never get out. So I want to know what kind of experience you had in New Orleans working with diversionary programs uh, and working with restorative justice programs, particularly looking at juveniles and how we can keep them out of the system and give them a, you know, a, a, an opportunity to succeed. Very good point, and, and, and thank you for both of those comments. And yes, I have some experience with it, but back in New Orleans, the, the juvenile diversionary program was not a part of the police department. It was a part of the city's administration. Mm -hmm. And so while, while it existed, it didn't exist under our umbrella of law enforcement. And so we were a partner with the Office of Juvenile Justice that had a diversion program that dealt with kids. And then we could create policy, training, protocols, and practice that teach the officers how to appropriately respond when faced with certain circumstances committed by juveniles in very different approaches with other crimes and bad acts committed by juveniles. But, but yes, there is some, some practice we had with that, but it did not, it was not housed within the police department. And certainly we were always working with the mayor's team in the entire city for juvenile justice to make sure, especially with this consent decree, that we have youth programs built in the police department and that we have youth advisory councils that I talked about last night that if not already created, will be created and that we're working with juvenile justice to make sure we have an appropriate response to juveniles who are committing both minor and major offenses, and those responses are appropriate, and not holding them so accountable that it ruins them for life, but actually gives them a chance to self-correct. Thank, Thank, Thank you. So before we close out for tonight, the PC is going to recap what uh, he heard from you all this evening, and then he'll punt it back over to me just for some closeout comments. So thank you tonight. Thank you so much. This is so important. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I, I was late today, but I apologize. I said, I got a quick question for the close out. Is that 
So, so would, would, you like a quick question? Question? would you mind coming down to the microphone so that the camera can hear you, please? We'll take this last question and then punt it over to the PC. We want to make sure that he has time to talk to you all before you leave. Hi, my name is Marquise Freeland. I was late to today, so I don't know if you answered this or not, but I heard you touch on the uh, topic of recruitment. And one of the biggest issues I know within the communities, the police that, have, that are responsible for basically surveying the community, the people that live there aren't comfortable, or the I guess there's a lot of discrimination and so forth, or maybe the police officers themselves are scared. I don't know if you have a white cop that doesn't know how to deal with, you know, uh, melanated people or Hispanic people or <laughs> so forth. But on that has been a big issue here, and I was just thinking, like, if you, if you are going to do this whole thing of recruitment, kind of focus on putting people in certain communities that are more familiar and that take the time to kind of have a rapport with the people that live there because those issues happen a lot. I've seen it a lot over the years mm -hmm. from living here. I'm sorry, I'm from Madison Park, by the way. Ma'am, and you said your name is? Marquise Freeland. Freeland, thank yeah. you. Good, good point, and you bring up a point that's uh, actually something we talked about last night, bias, free policing, mm -hmm. and our ability and the commitment for us to bring if it not has already been done for me to bring an implicit bias training to every member of the department. And this implicit bias training teaches us about our own biases and the biases we have about other people, how to overcome that because they're always there. Right. And how to overcome that and perform in a way that's just and, 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 more, and, and moral and fair and mm -hmm. equitable. Um, and when it comes to staffing and resource allocation about staffing police officers where we think they're best served, that is a great concept, and most police chiefs, we, we try to do that as much as we can, but what we don't want to do is cripple our police officers where they're not able to perform in an area because we've only limited them to performing areas that they're comfortable with. Right. I want to make sure that we have diversity. officers that are trained to perform everywhere, right. and that can be sensitive and empathetic to your concern. Right. And when you call for the police, the question should not be where are you from, the question is will you help me? Right. But I definitely want it to be uh, some kind of focus on diversity versus the, the police officers coming into the community because you see so often that um, somebody that is not familiar with that culture or their partner is not from that culture, certain things may happen that mm -hmm. may not have needed to escalate, but they don't know how to take it. Or they might, they might feel scared or intimidated or whatever the issue is, you know. So. But it's our job to train them. Right. Exactly. to overcome those biases so that they won't be scared and that they know how to handle it appropriately. Right. But certainly people who are familiar with a particular neighborhood nuance or culture or traditions and things like mm -hmm. that from a particular neighborhood, certainly you have success when officers who are familiar with it live and work there. Right. That, that happens. The reality in this world is that there's so few police officers mm -hmm. and such a high demand mm -hmm. and we're asked to be all things to all people and we're responding to to just thousands upon thousands upon thousands of calls that it becomes difficult and then to staff that like that. Mm -hmm. And then yes, recruiting is a challenge but we're working to make that more robust. But to the extent we can, officers that are better served in communities where we know uh, they're gonna be extremely effective, right. that's, that's always the goal. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Freeland. And so tonight, it's, it was very good, and thank you for that. She brought up an issue, biased free policing, implicit bias. Certainly something we want to deal with. We're committed to it. It's in our consent decree. It's forthcoming and part of our, our change. I heard quite a few talking about restoring public trust, accountability, um, consent decree compliance. A few of you asked me about how we're going to implement and, and sustain this consent decree compliance. Culture change. That's the, that's the biggest thing. All of it will come together when we change our culture and create the right culture that, number one, we can perform at a high level because we've cultivated, trained, coached, and mentored, and developed the best police officers, supervisors, managers, and leaders in the department that, that, can, that they can possibly be. Then we change culture. We start delivering services that are fair, just, and equitable to you and then your perception of the police department changed. That's all within culture change. It takes time, but that's underway. That's our commitment. Community engagement and community policing. So many of you talked about that. 
That is the core function of the police department. It is in our mission statement. It is about everything we do, and our training is centered around community policing. From the first day of the police academy to the last day, to the day you become a full sworn officer, everything we teach is surrounded around how to be a community policing police officer. Drug dealing and laundering, I heard quite a few talk about that. Pennsylvania Avenue, a couple of other streets, yes. Um, Lexington? Market. I got it, among other places. I heard a lot of you talking about that. I started as a drug officer chasing the drug dealers. I, I did that work. It's dangerous, but it's important. We're doing it. We will do it. It'll enhance. And, and we're going after them. And we're going to make sure that we can tell you about it. We'll come back and tell you what it is we did. And then we'll go out and do some more of it. And you tell us where it's happening. We go out and we can deal with it. But I'm working to change the culture to make sure our people understand how important this is and they go out and, and perform at a high level. And then I will be holding all of our people accountable for either doing it or for not doing it. And so that's our commitment. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Best practices regarding repeat violent offenders. I'll need all of your help with that because while we are working to change the culture of crime in the community and the reasons why people commit crime and all the things that cause people to drive toward crime or get pulled toward crime, we're working on that with the mayor's team with this multi uh, multicultural and multi-diverse, this diverse, multicultural, multi-dimensional, multi-discipline approach. It's late, forgive me. <laughs> um, we're working on that. By the same time, we have to focus on the back end, the consequences for people who commit these bad acts and they're causing them to be repeat, repeat offenders. And if there are no consequences, people are making a decision to commit crime because they can get away with it. We're working on that as well, but I will need your support both locally and at the state level to fix that and correct that. Problematic stores and establishments, we're working on that. That's a, that's an issue for private business owners that are on private property. I'm eager and willing to work with any private business owner and any neighborhood association with our commanders leading that effort to make sure that we have open lines of communication, not only with you, but with those store owners so that we can get the right information and then create the most robust and strategic plan to go after those drug dealers and those lauders and people that are causing problems. That we want to make sure that policing is fair, equitable, constitution, and just. That's at the core of it all. And so, once again, I thank you for your attention. I thank you for all your great questions, comments, and concerns. God bless you, and I look forward to working with all of you. So just some final closing notes before you head out. Uh, if you wouldn't, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for sharing your hopes and concerns with the PC. If you wouldn't mind, please be sure to complete an evaluation form and turn them in. We're going to use your feedback to inform our next seven sessions. And feel free to join us at any of the next seven sessions. Get home safe tonight. Thank you all. <laughs>